Ladies and gentlemen, warm welcome from Autumn Berlin. Unfortunately, we're getting a bit colder here, uh, but it's still a pleasure to have you with us. My name is Daniel Stecher, Vice President of IBS Software, and um, today I'm your host for the monthly Aviation Women panel, where we have a fantastic guest speaker today. Today we have Sarah Hannon, who is talking about um, the um, I have the wrong slide today, sorry for that. <laughs> but we talk about virtual interlining. And uh, I think you have prepared a fantastic presentation. And uh, so stage is yours, Sarah. And I think we have threading 45 minutes. And then we also have a lively discussion. So all of you, please raise your hand if you want to ask a question or drop your questions in the chat window and we're happy to answer. So stage is yours, Sarah, and you're not talking about sustainability, but virtual interlining. <laughs> Phew. OK, thanks so much, Daniel. Um, and thanks very much, all of you, for, for joining today. Um, if you're as busy as we are at the moment in, in the world of aviation, then uh, I know time is tight. So um, very much appreciated and, and great to meet you all. I will now uh, rapple with Teams, which is not my favourite uh, a method of video conferencing, but uh, let's see how we get on. OK. We can see the slide. Okay. Looks good. OK, brilliant. And it moves. Great. It moves. OK, Fantastic. so um, so I guess let me introduce myself. First of all, um, my name is Sarah Hannan, as, uh, as Daniel uh, suggested, um, my um, I work for DoHop, which I am going to talk about um, a little bit today, but I, I am not, um, I don't want this to be a sale, DoHop sales pitch. That's not what it's designed to be, but naturally um, we exist in the space of virtual interlining. So I will refer to us um, quite frequently. Um, <clears throat> I um, live in Berlin, um, but you can probably tell by my accent that this is not where I was, where I was born. Um, so I've lived in Berlin for about four and a half years. I moved here from London um, just after the Brexit vote. Um, and I moved here to uh, work for a business called Omeo, which actually focuses on ground transportation. Uh, so they have built the, uh, the, the broadest um, platform of, of, brown, of ground transportation across Europe. I was director of partnerships there. And then previously to that, um, I worked in um, meta search and deals publishing for um, for flights. Um, I've done a little bit of recruitment and headhunting um, and my travel career kicked off um, as a good old fashioned travel agent um, for SCA travel that sadly no, no longer with us. But um, so I guess uh, I'm not um, shock horror from an airline. Um, I don't <laughs> I don't have an airline or, or specifically aviation background, um, but my 14 months to date at Doohop has um, ramped up that learning curve pretty, pretty quickly. Um, but I'm sure you all know much more about aviation than I do. So don't ask me too many difficult, <laughs> too many difficult airline related questions. Um, so the title of the, the, the talk today is Virtual Interlining um, Challenges and Opportunities for Airlines. Um, so I, I, I will cover um, kind of what virtual interlining is, um, a little bit about how we, um, how we approach it, um, what the challenges and opportunities are and um, where, where things are, are heading a little bit in, in the future. Um, if there's any questions, as, as Daniel said, then please just um, raise your hand or Daniel, just if I don't see them, then just let me know. That would be that would be much appreciated. OK, so. Now I'm not moving. Uh, Maybe hmm. the arrows um, left and up ah, and down. Exactly. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, OK, so a, a, a quick introduction to, to DoHop. Um, we are on a mission to um, revolutionize uh, travel connectivity. That's our that's our strap line and, and, and what we what we stand for. Um, and how are we going to do that? Well, a little bit more about our history. Um, DoHop was established in Reykjavik in Iceland, where they still are headquartered today. 
Um, and actually, they started way back in 2004. So we're not we're not a startup. Um, and we started as a flight meta search engine. And that was really um, because traveling from Iceland back then was was pretty difficult. Um, and um, the the kind of USP of the, the do hop meta search engine was to focus on connections rather than point to point flight comparison. So it was always looking at A to C via B rather than rather than just comparing A to B. Um, that meta search did relatively well, um, but kind of roll forward 10, 10 to 12 years, um, we started a relationship with uh, Gatwick and launched a, a product called Gatwick Connects, which was really formed from um, the volumes that we were starting to send through Gatwick. They noticed that connectivity was happening um, and they wanted to explore a little bit more about how they could um, expand that at Gatwick and, and make the, the process um, and the user experience easier for, for passengers. So Doohop worked quite closely with, with them on that. Um, and then EasyJet took, took notice um, and actually um, invested some money into Doohop to um, really explore how we could, again, expand this concept of connectivity um, through um, through API and through kind of virtual interlining, really because EasyJet were, were not and are not willing to move into the more traditional um, world of, of interline agreements and, and complexity that, that that can bring. So we launched Worldwide by EasyJet, um, which is a platform that, that we built for EasyJet, and I will demonstrate this shortly. Um, which was the first global airline connection service by, by a European um, LCC, powered by Doohop. And that platform today is remains our flagship platform. Um, we connect EasyJet today to about 18 other airlines and um, Deutsche, Deutsche Bahn for, for rail. Um, but as I say, I'll show you how that works. Um, and now we're a leader in alternative interline technology. We have over 80 carriers, um, onboarded into our ecosystem. So a network of, of, of sorry, 60 carriers that um, can all connect to each other if, the, if they want to. Um, and we have uh, more than 100 Doohop employees based not just in Iceland, but all over the world. And to give you a flavor of uh, our volumes, um, so during peak periods, over 2,000 um, Passenger connections a day are generated through Doohop enabled technology. Um, so, yeah, that's um, a significant number. Um, we obviously want it to continue to, to grow, um, but that is all connections generated either by um, connecting an airline to each other. So, on, so online, online connections, EasyJet to EasyJet, Transavia to Transavia. Um, or what we call interline connections, so connections between two different carriers. So what's the landscape um, that we compete in? Um, so the overarching landscape is, of course, interline, um, where an airline selling um, sells an itinerary to a, a customer that involves services provided by another airline. That's That's the landscape that we exist within. Um, what is the problem that we're trying to um, address? Well, the legacy interlining framework can be extremely um, challenging and um, time resource in intensive and cost intensive. Um, and what we're trying to bring to the industry is um, a simplified way of uh, connecting to um, either existing uh, or similar types of carriers, so full service to full service, low cost to low cost, or indeed a, a combination of, of, of all of those things. So our technology um, allows anyone really to, to connect to each other. Um, yeah, and, and, what, and what is this called? Well, it is traditionally called um, virtual interlining. Um, it's a phrase that we kind of love to hate <laughs> a little bit. Um, virtual interlining, I think, was sort of um, born from um, the OTA space who were who were who were making these connections um, with with airlines with or, with and without their their approval. Um, but it is ultimately the, the space in which we we exist. 
but actually it's not really virtual with us because we everything we do we do in in partnership with our carriers so when an airline works with us they choose who they partner with um which routes they they connect on which which seasonality of routes they connect on it is it is completely um within their control nothing nothing is outside of their control we work hand in hand with them so we don't like to call it virtual really uh we like to differentiate ourselves a little bit and and we're sort of veering towards the alternative interlining but for today's um today's scope i think it, it helps kind of put in the in the picture what what it is that we're that we're doing um so how is virtual interlining made possible? Well, um, basically, it is a proposition that enables um, air to air and now um, intermodal connections. So I mentioned earlier that we that we connect um, Deutsche Bahn actually with EasyJet and um, Vueling today, and that's through our existing um, technology, um, which is API based. So. For an airline to work with us, we need to access their content through um, through API connections, um, which most airlines have in existence today. Um, we work with all of the, the the PSS systems that that can supply content to us, um, and we also work with a with a number of aggregators. So as long as we can surface or, or obtain the the content that that we need, um, then we can we can onboard an airline into our into our ecosystem. Um, this means that when it's when what what that means is that there is um, there is a direct relationship between um, between us and the airline, but also between the airline and and the passenger. And I'll, and I'll talk about that a little a little bit later on. Um, but essentially, a, a booking that that is made in our in ecosystem mimics or, or replicates just a booking that is made on the airline.com. So there is instant the airline receives instant instant payment. Um, it receives um, the customer data, so they're able to to, to speak to the, the customer um, after the booking has been made, um, and they're also able to surface ancillaries. So one of the key um, selling points is that if ancillary products are available in the airline's APIs, um, then we are able to to surface those surface those for them, and that is for both both airline within the connection that that we have created. Um, what is the benefit? Well, I guess interestingly, um, you know, we've been on a journey through COVID, like like everyone else in this industry, um, and we have more demand now than we have ever had in our in our existence, and and that is really because um, we are finding that airlines are now having to just think differently about how they're going to expand their networks, and and that is you know due to obviously due to cost um and you know resources um they 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 need to look at the market and think about um new innovative solutions that can just bring them feed to their origin points and 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 take their passengers on to their from their destination points as well and um as i say in the in the virtual interlining space we can unlock that um we think much more quickly than in the than in the traditional space so let's have a quick look i will stop talking and let's see if we can have a a, a quick um demo so um this is the um easyjet homepage um i'm going to take you through the journey just from the from the easyjet.com homepage um and and show you what i'm what i'm talking about so I'm just going to make a quick selection. Uh, let's do. Uh, to. Montreal, um, so actually you can see here. Uh, there's an indication that something else is going on here. You can see worldwide is is mentioned in each of these of these selections here. Um, so if I select Montreal um, and I'm going to select date in November, uh, you will see that I've now been I've asked to click on show worldwide flights. So that is that is something a little bit different from the normal user flow on on easyjet.com. If I click on that, I'm now taken to the worldwide by easyjet co-branded do hop platform. 
Um, so this is a this is a, a microsite that we host for EasyJet. Um, so here we have uh, we've basically kind of crunched the numbers in the back end. We use OAG schedules to to um, establish connectivity and where the where the connections exist. Um, then we've built the the front end um, to be able to surface this to to EasyJet customers. Um, and then we'll just quickly go through the flow. So we can see that uh, the option here is, yeah, with, with Air Transat, we also have WestJet, but but um, so this is connecting EasyJet with, um, with Air Transat. I'm going to just select the first option. It's going to take a little bit of time. But this is a connection from Milan to Montreal via London. Um, it's a pretty reasonable price <laughs> under 300 euros for, for a one way um, to Canada um, and it's not a horrendous time. So under under 12 hours um, and then we'll see that uh, as I was talking about ancillaries, we are able to um, to surface uh, fair families um, and we match those as closely as possible as 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 we can as as we can between the two the two parties. Um, you'll also see on the right hand side that uh, we have the basket broken out into um, each each component so the the user can easily see what it is that they're that they're paying for. Now you'll see here that we have um, a do hop fee. So obviously because this is outside the, the the scope of traditional interlining the responsibility does not land the responsibility for the entire journey does not land on either one of the the, the parties or that the airlines in this connected journey um, it actually lands with us so do hop also guarantee the connection for the passenger so if something breaks on the connection the fee that the the customer has paid us covers their their servicing so we have service centers um, we have four service centers globally 24 7 hour um, customer service and we will um, rebook reroute basically do make sure that the passenger reaches their end destination um, as soon as possible we monitor um, we monitor all of our connections in in real time so we have an alert we can see which ones are kind of starting to move to amber are gone to red and we will proactively contact the customer and 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 um, and, and rebook them uh, okay, I'll quickly just show you the rest of the flow. I, I have a question. How does it work with the bags? So checking in bags and then this uh, transfer uh, is, is all working well because usually low cost airlines are not having these connections. And now you have this example with uh, EasyJet and Air Transat. So how does this work with the bag? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so actually in this example, um, the passenger needs to recheck their bag. So um, this is what we would call self-connect, um, but we do have platforms um, such as Jetstar in Australia where they have enabled through check of bags, and they use Iarchi to do that. So they, so, so they, we we can mimic the, the the systems if they have those in place. We can we can surface those for our solution as well. But you're right um, for the low cost carriers that there is you know they do not have those those um, that architecture in in place. So we're working on um, we are working on solutions to be able to to kind of streamline that a little bit, but it's um, it is a complicated topic. Um, but it's in it's in everyone's interest to to do that, you know, because um, obviously we want to make the the journey smoother for the passenger, but we also want to we want to make the connection time shorter so that we can facilitate facilitate more connectivity and ideally keep keep passengers airside so they don't have to clear they don't have to clear security twice and and, and all of that so yeah we're, we're working on 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 that as well um so yeah so you so, you, you worked it within certain minimum connex time for that because going through immigration twice and checking yeah. in bags yeah is there two hours connex time or how do you somehow mitigate the risk people are having a misconnex time so, so actually, we work very closely with our airline partners on this. So, so there is a, there is a, a standard, you know, for each airport that, of course, we we um, pay attention to. But this summer, obviously, we had to massively extend <laughs> um, connection times. And and Norse, who who launched their their platform with us as as they launched their operations, um, they just said to us, actually, for Gatwick, 
we need the MCTs to be four hours this summer. And then, and then, you know, as things as as operations started to improve, then we can start to lower the the connection times. Um, but yeah, I mean, again, we we stay on top of that. We we monitor that very very closely. Uh, okay, um, and I'll just quickly go to the end, just so just to show you, yeah, all ancillaries um, included. Um, and then just to kind of highlight the point I made earlier, uh, the 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 passenger will enter their payment details once, but they will actually make three separate three separate payments, um, and they will receive uh, three separate. Well, they'll receive a, a, a confirmation from EasyJet, a confirmation from Air Transat, and then they'll receive an all-encompassing confirmation from from Doohop, kind of a super PNR, if you like, that that um, reiterates everything that they've booked. Um, that we are their their point of contact if things go wrong, um, and and any you know any other details that that they need. So that's that's the kind of product that I'm talking about. So you can see it in in action. Um, There's a question from Xenia from oh, Croatia. Yes. Xenia, do you want to ask your questions verbally yourself? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Hello to everyone. Yes, yes, please, please ask everything. Uh, yes, just a quick question, maybe better this way. So you said that the Do Hope is responsible in case of irregularities to find a new yes. solution for passenger. So let's say uh, on the example you provided. If mm -hmm. Air Transat is not able to provide the service, so you will rebook to WestJet, for example. We we could do that. Does it say does it say that you are aware of the commercial terms of the agreements between EasyJet and WestJet and EasyJet and Air Transat and Air Transat WestJet? This is how it works between the legacy carriers. So you so, have to be very careful and aware of the conditions that you can rebook and reroute the passenger. That's my question. Thank you. No problem. Sarah. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the way that it works is that um, essentially we're making two, there's two completely separate bookings, right? One booking with EasyJet and one booking with, with Air Transat. And those airlines are still responsible. They still have their same conditions of, of carriage, but we are we are protecting the connection. So um, if the if the EasyJet leg is um is is delayed we can obviously see that the air transat connection is is going to be missed so that is when we would step in and say okay um when when is easyjet going to rebook you when, when is the next available flight and we will arrange we will arrange the we will rebook the connection and if we can rebook with air transat that is of course what we will do in the first instance but but if that if if that is if they don't have a flight for another three days or that's not possible, then 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 we we take that cost. That is what that is what the passenger has paid us their the fee for. So so we take that cost to, to rebook on a different airline if we have to. That's very generous. <laughs> yes. Because yeah. I mean, at, the, at, the, at the short term rebookings, uh, only the higher valued RBDs can be open. So. This would be very costly and pricey, uh, uh, but okay. Course. Yeah, of course. But I mean, that's our, you know, that's our our, our business model, and and um, you know, that's that's we collect these the the fees, and and um, you know, we've we've come through a very difficult summer with lots of disruption. Um, but but the the business model works for us, as I say. We we would. You know, we would normally try and book with Air Transat. We have we have good relationships with all of these partners to say, OK, is there, you know, we, can we have a direct line into your contact centre? Um, is there a rescue fare that you're able to offer us in, in the last um, last number? Um, but it, it, worst case scenario, then then, um, yeah, we have to we have to make a completely new booking. We have uh, one more question from Sharina. Um, Sharina, please. Just ask. Uh, hi, I'm yeah. not sure uh, whether I'm breaking the flow here of the of the presentation, but I have a number of questions on how the product is offered. So, do you have finally two PNR numbers for the two bookings? How is the product pulled in? How is the um, I understand about the schedules from OAG, but how are the fares pulled in? How are the ancillaries pulled in with prices? How are the seat maps being pulled in? Um, yeah. 
uh, and then um, do you when you reaccommodate, uh, do you do that um, manually in the back end at your end, or is there an automatic reaccommodation? Do you have call centers for that uh, people can call in? So a variety of questions, but very, very interesting. <laughs> That's, good. That's good. That's good. OK, um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll quickly answer the quickly answer those um so that the first one is is easy so all the content is in is through api connectivity so through the apis we we don't the schedules we get from from oag but the ap api deliver the fares um the ancillaries um i think the seat maps that 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 might be wrong i don't i don't know for sure but but generally everything everything is gained through the through the api um Yes, there's two separate PNRs because there's two separate bookings that are made. So we're making a, okay. a booking. We're bu making a booking through the EasyJet API, and we're making a booking through the Air Transat API. And um, we can we can tell each airline about the other the other se sector if they want to know that. But but you know they don't have to know that actually because we are taking we are taking that that overall kind of super PNR view of the entire connected connected journey. Um, and in answer to your last question, yeah, absolutely. We have call centers, um, multiple multiple languages, 24 seven, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and at the moment it is quite a manual, um, it is a manual system. We are, we are, we are human beings. So they are human beings um, de dealing with, with this, but um, yeah, I, 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 on a further slide, you know, one of our aspirations is the future of the future is to is to certainly um, automate some of these processes. Mariana, you're raised. Okay. Here. Thank you. Uh, yes. Hi, Sarah. Uh, just some questions on my side. So, I believe you mentioned that you work a lot, for example, with the low cost carriers who don't have the infrastructure to do the interlining. But do you see, does your product also have a business case for the larger carriers? For example, when you have, you know, FKLM, Delta and Virgin that we know that they interline, but do you see this product also being relevant for those large carriers that have that infrastructure? Um, yes, definitely. Um, and I can give you, I can give you a really good case study. Um, so Air France came came to us um, saying um, we need to be able to track, we need to be able to sell Transavia because they're they're part of the same part of the same group and they they couldn't sell each other. Um, so through Doohop technology, because they couldn't sell each other technically, right? It was on two different PSS systems. Um, but through our technology, because we're kind of the middleware, if you like. Um, then we then we build a platform for both of them. So both Transavia and Air France have have one of these platforms that you see in front of you, um, which facilitates sales of of each other. Um, so that's one you know that's one kind of interesting use case based on based on tech really, where there's an absolute need to sell each other, but they can't do that in the traditional space. Um, but that's still using a, an LCC, of course. Um, I, I guess on the on the um, traditional kind of full service carrier um, and traditional interlining, yes. Um, all I can say is that we have a lot of interest right now as in how in how we could not necessarily replace existing interline relationships, but but complement them because sometimes the traditional interlines don't cover all connectivity, right? They don't cover all they don't cover all routes. Um, they they don't necessarily have access to all content or all fare classes, whereas whereas with our solution, um, you can, you know, it's all that it's all the availability that's it's the same pricing that's sold on the doc, the airline dot coms um, and it's the and it's the same availabilities. So um, and that was another point I was going to make, you know, not all traditional interlines are sold um, through direct channels. So another reason to use our product is because it's driving it's driving direct traffic. So it's it, it's driving direct as opposed to as opposed to kind of indirect third party. So um, I would say we we're not ready to replace, but we are we are certainly there to complement those existing agreements. Cool. There's a question from Hamburg. Gunas, you raised your hand. Oh, we can't hear you. I was on mute. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Sarah, this is really an interesting topic. Uh, I don't know with our questions, we are troubling you while you were no, presenting. No, 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 so no. I'd much rather answer end. questions than talk to slides. It's fine. <laughs> 
Okay, great. Uh, my question uh, is basically on the interlining. If I see, uh, like, you know, there would be no need of uh, any disputes or any kind of complex agreements with carriers, and the settlement will be based on what you see the numbers on your screen, right? Yes, I'm going to show you this slide. Yes, exactly. Um, that is another beauty of this. There is absolutely no settlement between the airlines at all. So the the uh, so it is instant settlement with the with the with the carrier directly. So we send we send the payment through the APIs. So the passengers the passengers with credit card details is securely sent to the airline directly through through their API. So that is that is the settlement process direct with the passenger. It's not between it's not airline to airline. Okay, so uh, this uh, raises another question. So whatever airlines are in your portal, like whatever airlines now, for the example, what you gave from Milan to Canada, mm -hmm. uh, you had the option of Air Transat and EasyJet. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, your portal wouldn't do any comparison with any other competitive airline which you have no agreement, say like, uh, after Milan, there could be a Canada. You don't have that option, so uh, um, it will never throw up those uh, options to a customer. It it could do. I mean, I just selected a route that actually there was only one option for. So um, if I'd have selected another Canadian route, then you probably would have seen an option with WestJet as well, because WestJet are a are a do hop enabled carrier so we i guess if i understand the question correctly we don't work with everyone every single carrier in the world because because we work in partnership so we we only work with carriers that want you know that agree to to work with us so what okay. so what i'm showing you here is is that is the the overall list of of who is working with us today so you can see um but of course, we are talking. One of the reasons I'm so busy at the moment is we are talking to many, many, many others um, in in at any one time. And um, yeah, we onboard those when we see, you know, when they we see there's a good opportunity for connectivity with with another airline within our ecosystem. Thanks, thanks for this. Okay, Sarah, this is Ksenia. If I may, another question. Yes, you ha you have mentioned. Air France and Trans Transavia. Yes. Uh, does it say that you provide a solution where the ticket and ticketless carrier can interline? Because Air France is traditional legacy. They issued electronic tickets and Transavia, to my knowledge, does not. Or thank you. Yeah, absolutely. That that is again. That is. Because we are making two separate two separate bookings, then um, that that isn't a challenge. That is that is completely fine. Okay, thank you. Okay. There was one more question from Sharina. Yeah, I think I can answer my own question, having thought about it. To be honest, uh, I was I'm going to ask how does the refund work to the original form of payment, but I guess uh, you you would again cancel via the API or yeah. Um, uh, yeah the 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 manual person would cancel and that would trigger off the API and then would uh, do the refunding. Yes. Exactly. Um, uh, what if there is a carrier who doesn't do an automatic doesn't price that automatic refund? Sometimes carriers uh, don't price that automatic refund uh, properly. Sometimes um, they they want forms that are uploaded for for cancellations. If that is the case, then then what happens if they don't have an API? Uh, or has that happened for Duhop yet uh, or not? Or is it always via API so far? Um, okay. I, I, well, that's a very that's a very timely question, actually. Um, so, the majority of our carriers are a, are full full fully API enabled. So payments is facilitated through the API. But but yes, there are some very important carriers in the world that don't yet have that that functionality. Um, so there are a, a, a couple of airlines where we where Duhop would be the merchant of record in in that 
in that scenario. So we would take the payment and settle with the settle with the airline. Um, we are starting to explore whether that is, you know, whether that's a, a path that we want to go down in 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 kind of more volumes. Um, but in that scenario, of course, then we would take the liability of the payment and and return it. Okay, thank you. Um, I uh, you when I was at but with Emirates, I used to do the mobile web, so I was involved in the entire flow when we redid okay. it for premium economy. So I can uh, I can really visualize the flow, and when you say interlining, it really rings uh, a bell for me. So that's why all the questions. And uh, Anne and I were having a chat in the background, saying, "Ha, ah, no need for revenue accounting as well." <laughs> so very very interesting. Thank you. Well, Sharina, you I mean you may or may not know, but. Emirates are one of our airlines. They are Emirates are onboarded. They connect to um, EasyJet actually on the worldwide platform that I just showed you. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm aware, but I had kind of forgotten about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so I just, in the interest of time, I'm not going to talk through, <laughs> not going to talk through every single um, step of this, and I can of course share share this afterwards if it's of interest. But I think. Um, this probably summarises lots of what we've just kind of talked about, um, about the, the difference between, you know, between um, traditional and, and, and virtual interlining. Um, and I guess um, something that's kind of interesting, which is the, the, the bottom point, which is implementation time. Um, you know, the other really important factor to this is, is time to market. And, and again, you know, I think that's why we are kind of very in demand at the moment because in theory um, if all things going well this is a, a matter of months to market as as opposed to um, sometimes when the traditional interline um, agreements can can take a, a long time um, and probably the only other point um, which is on here somewhere um, yeah is is that actually we the, the the paperwork required to do this is very very light touch because we're not we're not talking about um, you know SPA agreements um, and 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 all of those all of that paperwork. It's generally um, a very kind of light touch uh, document um, and a data processing agreement. So that that can that can make things much easier as well. Um, but let's talk a bit, a little bit about the challenges because I've made it sound all amazing and uh, you know there's <laughs> there's obviously some some downsides. Um, <sighs> So the challenges are that it is still relatively new in in airline years. Um, it's it, it's you know it's not it's not aligned across the industry. There's not standards as such. Um, it's it's still something that takes um, quite some time to work through the ranks of an airline. There's multiple stakeholders on an air, on the side of the airline that need to understand what what this is. What the touch points are with the passenger, how it how it works. So um, that means that it can take it can it, you know it, conversations can take some time um, to work through the work through the system and and, and get approvals. Um, there is restricted distribution. So even though um, as as Doohop, one point I didn't mention is that um, we also uh, facilitate distribution of the the new routes that we've created. We we distribute those through the meta searches. So we have APIs set up with Google Flights, Skyscanner, Kayak, so so that we can get these get these routes out to market and eyeballs on them and and get them booked. But of course, you know that's a tiny part of the overall um, airline distribution market. So right now um, we are not distributing this content through the GDS or through through OTAs. So there there is some restrictions there. Um, Full service carriers fare structures can be a little bit limiting, um, and what I mean by that is, we are looking at some of sec. We use some of sector fares um, for for this. So if there is um, if there if there's some of sector fares can be can be expensive, then that means that the 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 connected itineraries are are not as competitive as as perhaps they could be. Um, Lowest common denominator payment options. So at the moment, because we're taking one payment method um, and send uh, and sending the payments to to both airlines, we can only use the the payment methods that are common to both airlines. So we so we don't have a, a huge array of of payment options which we would like to change. Um, 
we've talked about baggage service provision you know there is there is a limited there's limitations around around that um and of course you know customer ex, ex, we have to work very hard to manage customer expectations around their their journey and and ha, and what they've booked and how this and how this is going to work for them um but then on the flip side um you know the opportunities are much of what we've discussed so there is interest very much growing in in this space and um, the value that it can bring um Interline partnerships impossible under legacy framework are made possible by us. So talking about the, the low cost carriers and, and the tech piece that I mentioned. Um, and um, as we said, full service carriers are interested um, in what this can bring them, especially with respect to direct distribution. Um, there's ancillary revenue streams that are that are possible with with our system that are not necessarily possible with the traditional setup. Um, and potentially, you know, there's a great this brings a greater choice for passengers because it connects it connects carriers together that that historically haven't been. So um, ideally, it, it opens up kind of new routes that that maybe were quite difficult to to obtain in the past. So finishing up, <laughs> um, what's next? Oh, GDP GDPR implications. Um, so, as I said, um, we sign a data processing um, agreement with each of our partners so that the, the GDPR is is covered um, with each of those agreements. Uh, with the passenger as well? Sorry? With the passenger as well? So, yeah, it's so data privacy from a passenger perspective. Yeah. So they they at the end of their booking they they um, they agree to the, the relevant okay. agencies. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. So, okay. So I'm definitely not going to talk through this slide and talk through offer order and <laughs> and one order capabilities. But I guess my point about this is that um, the move you know the the move is towards airlines taking control of of what they uh, of what they are distributing and and where and and how and um, the virtual interlining space the way that we do it um, offers them the ability to do that uh, so this is again not being done kind of behind their back they are in full control of of what inventory they're distributing and who they're and who they're distributing it with so um, we are very much working on how we kind of um, what's the best way to say it sort of fit our you know fit our solution into this into this framework how does it complement this framework to make sense um, to those airlines that are that are moving in in this direction Monavara, you have a question. Uh, yes, yeah. I just want to know, is there a limit of how many interline partners can be involved in one booking? Is there like a limit or? Yeah, I mean, at the moment, we're only doing the maximum of two. OK, um, there's not I guess there's not a reason why we couldn't do more. It just needs to be a reasonable itinerary. Um, but having said that, we do we do offer two stop itineraries. So, okay. um, yeah, they, they, there could be two stopovers, but at the moment it's a, with a maximum of two carriers. Thank you. Okay. But you can make two bookings with two interline and you have four. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you could do that. Yeah. Um, OK, so just finishing off, what's next for us? Um, well, we want to expand our content. Um, I want us to move to six, from 60 to 100 um, as, as soon as possible. Um, we continue to engage with the industry, touching on the offer and order alignment that I mentioned. Um, we need to move to the next generation of our product, and that is really investing in the, the check through baggage offering um, and more self-servicing for our passengers so um, there are certain tasks that will also always need to be um, managed by a, a human being but there are obviously other much much kind of low lower light touch tasks that would that we could automate um, we want to learn from our intermodal offering and and grow it um, we will definitely be growing our content next year um, but there's still lots to learn around around intermodal um, it's a big buzzword everyone's interested in it but um, we still you know we need to we need to get more 
volumes going through through that. Um, and you know, we also use a lot of industry insights. We have we have really good um, data sources. So we look at we look at connectivity uh, for potential partners by using the OAG schedules, as I mentioned. But we then overlay that with um, with Skyscanner demand data. So we can see, okay, there's connectivity with I don't know um, Finnair and Indigo, um, but but let's see whether there's actual demand data for those routes looking at the, the Skyscanner data and what what you know what users are searching and, and clicking on. Um, so we're developing our capabilities in in that area as well. And I think that is all. Fantastic, Sarah, fantastic. I think the amount of questions showed already you exactly touched the right topic. And um, so now, I think the floor is open for more questions. I would have one question already from my side. Um, are you somehow creating now also that the legacy carriers try to rebuild what you have? Or is it more that they try to work with you in order to save time? Because you, usually airlines have always a tendency to try to keep control and build everything in-house. So have they learned and go now uh, to Dohop, or is it still that they try to defend their local kingdoms and try to to rebuild what you are bringing to the marketplace? Um, that's a really good question. I, I I I don't think yeah I don't think they're trying to rebuild what what we have. I I think they they would just the the should they do it in in the, the the usual way the ways they've always done it right? Should they should they they try and move um move the low cost carriers into the traditional methodologies as opposed to them embracing the the new methodologies. Um, yeah, we haven't really come across anyone that said actually, no, no, we're going to build this ourselves. And and the resources that may, maybe even once were there pre-COVID are, are not necessarily there anymore to, to be able to do that anyway. Further questions from the audience, please. Um, yeah, actually, I think it was a bit related to that, but yeah, my, my main uh, question was, what will, what is the biggest challenge that you have when you implement this in an airline? So, And I'm not so much thinking in terms of the systems, because if they are fully API enabled, then it should be fine, but rather from an organizational perspective, if you usually find, you know, challenges in that sense. Yeah, well, I can tell you the topic that we get the most questions about um, is the passenger servicing piece which is totally understandable um, because, you know, it's a different concept. Every airline is used to is used to servicing their their own passengers. And um, it's it takes, you know, it's 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 a big deal to trust someone else to, to service your your passengers. Right. Um, so that is generally what we spend a lot of time. Um, we bring in our customer service director to the meetings. He talks talks them through and we and we, and we tend to talk about every single edge case scenario that, that you can that you can possibly imagine which is again totally fair enough but um yeah so that's that's what we get the 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 most um the most questions ab about um i guess you know one thing i would say on that that topic while i'm thinking of it is that um our trust pilot rating is is 4.8 which is out of five which is which is pretty good you know that's that's reviews from our from our passengers that have used our services in a in a you know it generally when things have gone wrong right that's when they that's when they contact us um so we're pretty proud of the the service that we're able to 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 offer and that i think that helps to allay some of the the concerns ar around that topic and and i guess the other the other challenge is as i said is really just it's just the number of stakeholders that need to sign off on a concept like this. Um, and, I, you know, I don't, that's not unusual within a, within a large organisation, of course, but it, I think what we do just does t tend to touch more, <laughs> more people than, than perhaps some of the other, you know, sort of software solutions that, that, that are out there. Um, so sometimes you feel, you know, it's, it's kind of one step forward, two steps back, but um but it's okay, you know. We just have to be be patient and and keep the dialogue moving. Go on, us. You have a question. 
Yeah, uh, I have a question, Sarah. It's really impressive to hear that rating. It's really excellent. Super applause for me, <laughs> too. <laughs> uh, uh, the question that I have, since this is basically a non-standardized uh, virtual in lining scenarios what you, you explained uh, how do I differentiate this with the legacy ones where we have uh, carriers have bilateral billings and bilateral agreements uh, to me it sounds similar uh, is there anything which distinguishes virtual interlining against bilateral interlining or agreements with the airlines? Uh, I'm just talking from the legacy point of view because the kind of process flow what you showed us seems to have been existed a few years ago also. So is I it think, like something different? I think from a payment point of view, it's easier for the airline, right? Uh, the money is there immediately. You don't have to wait for the settlement to happen like a month later uh, from from yeah, through IATA. Something which had been existing also uh, in the past years. So yeah, I, I mean, I, uh, and uh, you know, I'm not I'm not a I'm not a traditional interline expert at all, but. Um, you know, my understanding is that um, often in that that framework, there can be some complexity around fares and and you know and the kind of agreements and 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 costs between between the airlines. I mean, in in our solution, um, there really is very little cost <laughs> to the to the airline, right? Because they're they're um, potentially the only cost really is is on the meta distribution piece where they need to pay some commission to the to the meta searches um and if if we build a platform for an airline then um we might have a small monthly cost but we offset that against against volumes so really we're taking the cost out of that that relationship um but having said that you know our distribution is not as wide as as potentially would would be achieved by a by a you know a, a traditional interline agreement just because at the moment we're not we're not distributing through through the through the trade okay. and Can you share a bit more about uh, let's say the sales approach and um, how you tackle uh, obstacles so do you have a lot of inbound requests or are you going to certain airlines because you want to add them into your network and then if uh, if you have this typical discussion, are you providing like an trial version that the airline people who have maybe who rather see the problem than the opportunities can somehow get a sense how this will work or how you somehow guide the airline to the better destiny while working with you? Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I, I guess the answer is it's all of those. Um, I mean, we have we do have lots of exciting inbound inquiries, um, but but I just I was telling Daniel I've just returned from Roots in in Las Vegas last week, um, where we had a lot of meetings, not necessarily you know in, in sort of proactively made and 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 reactive meetings, um, and during those meetings what what we do um, as a first step is that we look at our our data, we look at our connectivity studies, we look at the Skyscanner data that I mentioned. And we really understand what the opportunity could be for for this airline, and, and that could be um, connectivity within our existing ecosystem. So who who could they connect to that we have already? But it might also be who can they connect to that that we don't have that we're not you know we don't have already, and we might well be talking to those to those other airlines, or or we might not be. So so there can be kind of multiple approaches where um, we you know. Southwest Airlines, hello. We really want to. We really want to work with you. So we are, you know, we are trying to knock knock down the, their door. Um, but there might be another opportunity where a really strong airline comes along, and we can we can approach a, you know, approach a new partner together. So it it yeah, it really depends. And as we are here, ladies beyond flying, do you also experience certain situations where, let's say female managers are more open for that kind of approach compared to male managers or the other way around 
Um, is there also something what this group can learn from you in sales approach and um, maybe follow your example? Gosh. Uh, <laughs> well, I think it's interesting at an, at an airline um, conference because being a female, you tend to stand out a little <laughs> A little bit, right? Um, because it's still very, still very male, um, male orientated. Um, so uh, you know, I, I, I think that's um, that's that's something that is is good. That means that you can start to have a, you know, that generally you can start to have a conversation. But I, but I guess for me, I just, you know, I, 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 I try and keep it as. Um, I try and have the data with me, right? I try and I try and kind of get our message across as as, as quickly as possible, and and try and use use data to um to substantiate what I'm saying, so that you know it, it's clear that I know what I'm I know what I'm talking about, um because I think that can that can be important. Um, are there is it easier with with um female managers than male managers? I I don't know. I, I don't. I don't. I wouldn't say there's a there's a distinct difference, to be honest. And is it because you you are bringing something innovative to the industry, and now being the female uh, salesperson during these presentations, do you sense that you have to prove more, and you get certain questions which for you are no brainer because there is not just the the mistrust towards this innovation, but Plenty of male managers. Now you're there in the room, and you have to show, hey, no, I exactly know what you're talking about. So yeah. you have situations like this. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, but but yeah, I I guess the other challenge for me is because I'm not necessarily, and you know, I, I can't say oh, I've worked in an airline for 15 years. Um, so so that means that I have to, I can't, you know, I have to compensate for that. Um, anyway, but but yeah, I mean, you're 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 dead right, Daniel. You know, we we have to. We we probably have to dub, work doubly hard to prove that we that we know what we're talking about. Any other question from the audience? I had a question on the pricing. So Sarah, usually when there is a connection and if it's priced right, I mean as a pure connection, it is usually cheaper. Um, so when you put two uh, segments together, two PNRs together, wouldn't it be pricier for the passenger? Um, it, it it really depends on the pricing of the of the airline um, and and the route. You know, sometimes, like the example that I showed you um, from Milan to um, Montreal for under three hundred euros one way, I think I think that's pretty reasonable. And that's including our including our fee as well. Um, so there's there's some itineraries that that come out significantly um, significantly cheaper through some of sector pricing. But then there's others where it is it is not competitive. And you know it's it's actually on us to really monitor the market and understand which itineraries we're creating are are competitive and 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 which just aren't. And and also work with our airline partners to say. Okay, you know this this isn't necessarily going to work for you unless you can unless you can provide us some of a, a different source of pricing because um, you know we're just we're just not creating competitive itineraries. Okay, so if they know that it is from you, then they can price differently potentially yeah, for you. Okay, yeah, yeah. okay, yeah, yeah, okay. Of course. Yeah. And, I mean, it's just about what if it's available in their API. You know, we can have a dialogue and say this is what we think will work, and you can surface it for us. Then, um, then yeah. Okay. I also wanted to um, know from um, from your experience with airlines, do they close off any fare classes for you, or what is the trend, um, or have they been open to um, all fare classes being given to you? Uh, I, I don't 100% know the answer to that. I've I have not had a conversation about closing off a fare class, so I I I, I suspect not. But um, I will ask the question and and come back to you. But I, I don't okay. think so. Okay, thank you. I, very, I think very they interesting. See as, they see it as incremental revenue, right? So yeah, uh, it's, definitely. It's definitely. not necessarily a reason to 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 close things off. So yeah. Yeah, I just wondered whether they give you uh, all the fares, even the low cost ones, the lower cost ones in the revenue buckets, and uh, expose only the higher ones to you at all. Uh, I just wondered uh, what has been the trend. 
Yeah, I mean, generally they give us the lowest, they, they give us the, the lowest fair families. I mean, we only surface three or four fair families on the, the platform, so we don't go through, you know, every, every single class. But um, yeah, I, I, I don't think they close anything off to us. Okay, okay, thank you. Even and if I may Sarah, add. Thank you very much for this fantastic presentation. Um, we will publish the recording, of course, and then I expect a lot of inbound requests from all over the world. And then um, <laughs> maybe next year we make another session and then we want to see how this of really course. evolved. Um, and yeah, just uh, looking into the future, first of all, we are meanwhile 844 members in our group. So we're going strong towards 900. Um, if you have a colleague who is smart, positive, enthusiastic and upbeat and shall join our community, please do the needful and invite her to Ladies Beyond Flying. And uh, we are already looking to the next uh, session in November. Claire is talking um, how to resolve with clarity and her new business. And then uh, we have a fantastic lineup in December, January, February and March. Interestingly, we are now having also somebody from the Learjet family. So uh, we are getting more and more traction also from that front. Um, and if you have somebody who shall appear on stage, um, please make us a recommendation uh, and we would be happy to have one of your uh, industry contacts as an upcoming speaker. So please stay healthy and safe until we see each other again. And uh, it was a pleasure to having you and uh, yeah, have a good evening or a rest of the day. Thank you very much for joining. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.